Remember this? It's the finale of 2000's X-Men, and Rogue has been captured by Magneto, who wants to exploit her power to turn all humans into mutants. All in all, pretty typical Magneto stuff, and yet the plot, like Eric's machine, is literally revolving around Rogue. So how did we go from that to this silent cameo in Days of Future Past a mere 14 years later? How could a character start off so integral to a franchise and end up being treated like an embarrassing ex not even four movies later? This is a two-pronged answer, the comics and movie politics. Despite occupying a large amount of narrative real estate in comics, throughout the 1990s, Rogue's arc ran out of gas. She stopped being one of the go-to story-driven characters. After Chris Claremont was removed from the X-Men in the mid-90s, no one other than Claremont really knew what to do with her. She just kind of coasted into the 2000s on nostalgia for the great highs the character had enjoyed under his tenure as a writer. Because sometimes a franchise's need to get bigger with each installment leads to once essential characters with nowhere to go. You can't keep inviting people to a party and expect every guest to be treated equally. But how could this happen to Rogue, a fan-favorite character and integral member of the X-Men team? How could she end up with less screen time than Mystique? To answer that, we have to go back to the beginning. The year 2000 was an exciting time to be a Marvel fan. The company had narrowly survived a bankruptcy and was seeing a resurgence because of potential movie adaptations. It was two years after Blade, which proved that not only could Marvel movies be actually entertaining, but they could also be profitable. And now we were getting to an X-Men movie with Patrick Stewart as Professor X. Fan casting was coming to life. The X-Men were coming to the big screen and it was looking good. No one was thinking about the comics at this point though, and how they had basically stopped laying creative track for future adaptations. This will come into play later. Claremont, a writer known for his complex depictions of women characters, piloted the X franchise to being the highest selling comic on the market during his almost 20 year time writing Marvel's Merry Mutants. However, after creative differences, Jim Lee saw him pushed off of the 1992 relaunch of Objectiveless X-Men number one, the highest selling comic of all time. The line lost focus and drastically dipped in quality. Of course, the movie execs weren't worried about this. They were only concerned with making one good movie. However, the fact that creators like Fabian Essiesa, Scott Lobdell, and Rob Liefeld just didn't have Claremont's story sense, dialogue chops, or intimate knowledge of the intricate plotting required to balance the ever-expanding cast is not only a direct reason why the late 90s X-Men books were so bad, but also why Rogue specifically was sidelined. General audiences were pretty unfamiliar with Jack Kirby's perennially beset upon mutants. Their only major exposure, outside of the comic book world, was Hayam Saban's X-Men the Animated Series. So the producers were smart to have a character as an entry point. Think Neo in The Matrix. So who do they use to introduce us to the wild world of the uncanny X-Men? Through Rogue, the very character that is going to be pushed aside rapidly. In X-Men, we have a prologue that sets up the world of the mutants and the central conflict between Professor X and Magneto. We meet Marie D'Encanto, aka Rogue. One reason fans could expect big things from the character is that she was being played by Anna Paquin, an actual Oscar winner for her role in the piano. And after Patrick Stewart and Halle Berry, Paquin was one of the biggest names on the call sheet. An actor of her caliber in the role seemed to indicate big things to come. And in the first movie, the fans' wishes were fulfilled. In the first act of the movie, Rogue accidentally puts her boyfriend into a coma and runs away, bumping into Wolverine. And then they have to go on the run, leading the two of them to meeting the X-Men. The important thing is that the movie wouldn't work without Rogue. It's through her that we are introduced to the world of mutants. We ask the questions we would want to ask, like how do the X-Men work? She's also a young woman, sympathetic and rightly horrified by her powers elements that make it easy for the audience to relate with her. And then at the end of the movie, her power absorbing abilities are central to the plot. For Rogue fans, it was exciting to see that she was a big deal in the movie because of how important she became in the books. Fans had every reason to hope that the sequels would have Rogue level up and get super strength, flight, a snazzy jacket, and a romance with Gambit. Unfortunately, with each movie, Rogue became less and less integral to the story. X2 has her around for some big scenes, but you could remove her from the story entirely and nothing would change at all. And still no new powers. In X-Men The Last Stand, she actually takes a cure for her mutant powers, and we have never been further away from the on-screen rogue that we all expected. And then in Days of Future Past, this. A blink if you miss it moment if there ever was one. 
And yes, they released a rogue cut of Days of Future Past that included some additional scenes of her rescue and healing Logan's mind, but none of it felt essential in an already over two-hour movie. In a featurette on the rogue cut disc, producer Hutch Parker explained, None of us wanted to see that sequence go, but that was the storyline. Because it was so self-contained, it really was its own separate mission, that it actually could be lifted with the least amount of negative impact on anything that came before or after. So even in the Rogue cut of the movie, her presence is pretty pointless. Rogue seemed to be in the sequels out of a sense of obligation. In essence, she really never became Rogue at all. You could blame that partially on the fact that Fox didn't have the rights to the Miss Marvel character. In the comics, Rogue levels up because she absorbs Miss Marvel's powers for herself. It all happened in Avengers Annual Issue Number 10, when Miss Marvel, aka Carol Danvers, went up against Mystique, who was Rogue's adopted mother. In order to protect Mystique, Rogue saps Carol. Since they couldn't put Miss Marvel in the movies, Rogue had no way to get super strong or the power of flight. This is also to say nothing of the fact that after her golden heyday of being written by Claremont, Rogue struggled to maintain the spotlight. After the romance between her and Gambit was resolved, she was stripped of her powers for a time, which the fans hated. Then she was made the leader of X-Men Legacy, which has a cult following but never really broke out. She also wasn't prominently featured in either Morrison or Quietly's New X-Men, a run specifically targeted at fans of the films of Joss Whedon and John Cassidy's Astonishing X-Men, meant to be a prestige return to form. She just wasn't there for the two defining reboots of the team, which left filmmakers with little to draw from. And then of course, there's Hugh. Besides copyright issues, there was another elephant in the room that kept Rogue from achieving her full potential in the movies. Hugh Jackman. Although Jackman was a veritable unknown when he was first cast in the movie, his charismatic performance would make him the movie's breakout star, a worldwide superstar, and the face of the franchise. He was a bigger part of the movies and the team than he ever was in the comics. So far, Jackman's still the only member of the original movie to get a solo film. In fact, he got three, one of which was great, one's okay, and one we don't talk about. So between copyright issues and Wolverine's popularity with audiences, Rogue never stood a chance. But the X-Men movies aren't the only franchise to have forgotten about a cast member. Part of the reason that characters could be forgotten is because each sequel has to be bigger than the one before it, and usually that means adding more cast members. And for every minute of runtime given to a new character that's added, there's that much less time for everyone else. Like the Alien movies, they're merciless to any character that isn't played by Sigourney Weaver or Michael Fassbender, killing off beloved characters like Newt, Reese, and Shaw in between actual movies. These poor souls didn't even get the luxury of being killed on screen. The Star Trek Next Generation movies struggled to focus on anyone that wasn't Picard or Data. In a TV show, there's time to focus from character to character over 20-plus episode seasons, but it's easy for your Geordies or Crushers to get lost in the move to the big screen. So what's the lesson here? Maybe that the very characters that help kick off a franchise can sometimes end up with a sort of Pyrrhic victory. The X-Men movie's success led to sequels, which led to the need for more mutants, and that meant less time for Rogue. Add to that the copyright issues with Ms. Marvel that sapped Rogue for any potential growth, and Hugh Jackman's superstardom eclipsing everyone else. The movies, like Rogue herself, kept absorbing more and more star power until something, or someone, had to give. And that someone was Rogue herself. And well, that's it for today's episode. If you enjoyed this one, press the like button down below, and if you haven't done so yet, please also hit the subscribe button. On the screen right now are hopefully two or more videos. Click on either of those, and hopefully I'll see you for the next video.